we're in the middle of what I would consider an epic series, honey. This is an epic series where the hell is heaven. We are borrowing biblical language. Do not let your neighbours get offended. Do not let your religious cousins get all offended. The Vibe Church is using the word hell in their sermon series title. We, we're just borrowing biblical language. No matter the context, it's in the Bible. I consider it worthy to be used. And uh, this is a series where we're trying to provoke some stuff. We're trying to stir up some stuff. We're trying to really get some things moving in our minds and an understanding, deepen our understanding around supernatural things, the reality of it, the application of it and the outworking of it in our lives. And already we're off to a good start. We covered Unseen Realm in the first week. Last week, we talked about angels. How many people appreciated a new perspective on angelic forces and spiritual activity? Today, we're gonna talk about demons. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Talk about angels, we're going to talk about demons. And I want to kind of just share a passage of scripture that'll set the tone for where we want to go. So turn with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. And uh, let me read from verse 8. It says, Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years. So the people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. And God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. A group of Jews were travelling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, uh, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them and attacked them, seven of them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to the Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honoured. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. And the value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. As I mentioned, today we're gonna unpack the idea of what the Bible explains about demons. More specifically, the reality of demons their purpose and their agenda in the life of the believer and how we appropriate or approach them as Christians. Are you ready for the Word of God today? All right, well, if you are ready for the Word of God, I want you to find five people, look them in the eyes and say, don't get scared now. Go for it, go for it. Don't get scared now. So I don't know how familiar you are with, you know, demonic activity, but I literally grew up around this stuff. It's second nature for me. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. How many people grew up in a Pentecostal experience or expression of church? Two of us. Hang on, there's got to be more Pentecostal out there. How many people grew up in a Pentecostal, like swinging from the chandeliers? Can't, yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. This is second nature for us. Second nature grew up in it. In fact, I shared a story with our team at Team Conference recently where, where, where one of my first experiences with what we could call exorcism or deliverance as we used in the Pentecostal church was pretty, pretty much from 10 years old. 10 years old. It was a normal every other Sunday occurrence in our church. Literally, I don't know what it was in the water those Sundays. It didn't happen every Sunday, but nearly every Sunday. We would be sure in the middle of worship or right in the middle of the sermon, there was some kind of manifestation. Now, as a kid, it was epic. I longed for these moments. Even in the middle of a boring sermon, you knew, pay attention, something's gonna happen. Something's about to break out in this place. And you could just see someone twitching it. That's him, that's them. 
And they would always take the person who was manifesting, whether they're yelling, screaming, convulsing, doing whatever they were doing in their version of a deliverance moment, uh, they would take them into the back room, the deacons. Deacons would come along and just not to disturb the service or the service could continue. They would take them, take them in the back room. All I wanted to know what hap- is what happened in the back room. That's what we wanted to know. What, what took place in the back room? So me and my buddy, my best friend, we decided one Sunday, this was the moment. Instead of going into service, let's hide in the back room. They had a cupboard in there and we thought if we just position ourselves in the cupboard, surely there is gonna be an, a moment some demonic activity, and we'll get to witness firsthand what happens in the back room. So we did. We, one Sunday, we went into the cupboard, we hid in the cupboard, and we waited, and we waited. We thought, maybe we'll leave. Maybe today's not the demonic activity day. But sure enough, just as about we were about to leave, all of a sudden, the door flung open, and people walked in, and there was someone manifesting this guy, and the deacons had him on the chair, and they're preaching Scripture over him. They're calling out all these different demons, calling out demon of lust. They're using the word legion. They're like calling, and it was crazy. All of a sudden, and we're in the, in the cupboard, and they had this, the guy on the chair. His back was to us like this, and we're in the cupboard watching through the little slats, like in the cupboard, watching all the activity, kind of freaked out already. But as they were rebuking, him, he turns around and looks straight in the cupboard at us. Well, of course, we do the normal grown mature thing. Ah! We were freaked out, literally freaked out, started screaming in the cupboard. I can't imagine what the deacons were thinking with shrieks coming from the cupboard. And we literally looked at each other, me and my buddy, and we, it was like we didn't even need to say anything. We remembered because in Sunday school, they had been teaching us about the full armour of God. We're 10 years old. They taught us actions, how to put on the helmet, put on the shield, the breastplate and the sword. And there was literally an action that you, you do. In that moment, as we're screaming, we look at each other. We didn't even say anything. We start putting on the armour and bust out of that place, running as we're doing, putting on the armour as we walk out of the room. It's a reality. I'm not making this stuff up. That was my baptism. It's a demonic activity. <laughs> Pentecostal church. We are watching uh, Stranger Things the other week with my daughters. And they're like, Dad, is this stuff scary? I said, bruh. <laughs> bruh, I grew up in Stranger Things. <laughs> it's the truth. But truthfully, the, the powers of darkness, I believe, have captured the attention and really the fascination of people throughout history, as we evidently see in pop culture. However, this has only really, in my opinion, produced some severe misunderstandings around evil spirits, even within the church. In my experience, especially growing up within a Pentecostal church, much of what Christians think about Satan, about demons, and about evil spirits is actually derived from, I would say, Christian traditions or stories more than an exegesis of Scripture. Now, at the same time, when it comes to the subject of demons or a sermon on demons, I'm, I'm aware it could easily be intimidating for some folks. So I want to approach this with what I would say is an appropriate perspective from the Bible around demonic activity. In fact, one of my campus pastors just recently, just last week, was telling me, and I'm not going to tell you which campus, but, but one of my campus pastors was telling me that they had somebody in their church when they heard the title of this series, Where the Hell is Heaven, and they would be talking about demons, and we were talking about hell and spiritual things. They literally said, nah, I ain't coming. I'm not doing it. Won't see me for this series. And they said, why? They said, well, you know, talk about demons and spiritual stuff just ain't my cup of tea. I don't want to know about it. Now, that kind of approach, how I many how people got little kids and you ever played hide and seek with a little kid and they run to the couch and get the pillow and put it over their head and they think they're hidden. But really they're exposed. Playing ignorant is like putting a pillow over your head and thinking that you're somehow invisible or protected from demonic activity. I am here to tell you that ignorance only makes you more susceptible to demonic influence and I aim to show you why today. Today, But before I do, just like last week as we kind of did a sermon and some teaching on angels where we busted some myths, common misconceptions around angels, I thought we could start by busting some myths around demons too. You down for that? How many people are down for that? Or we can get straight to teaching or we can bust some myths. How many people want to bust myths? How many people want to go straight to teaching? Okay, we're busting myths. All right. The, the first myth that I want to uh, expel is 
that demons are fallen angels. Demons, fallen angels. Now, now this, this concept is, I'm gonna use a big word, ubiquitous within the Christian teaching and preaching for valid reasons, being that it is actually partly accurate, but, but not fully explanatory. You see, in the New Testament, well, really, in many ways, in the same way that we see in the New Testament the word angel that, that describes the heavenly hosts, and the word angel is a term that is more functional than ontological, like, like, kind of like a job description. The same way in the New Testament, demon is a catch-all for the spirits. Are you with me? Yeah. It's where we clump together all of the disloyal spirits, evil spirits within the supernatural realm. In fact, in the Old Testament, you don't really find the, the term demon used at all. Instead, what we find is the actual names of evil spirits and idols and a record of betrayal by a particularly, uh, particular heavenly hosts that resulted in the birthing of demons, essentially, which are consistently cast as disembodied spirits of the dead Nephilim and their giant clan descendants, just to give you facts. So while the term fallen angels can kind of be used correctly in discussing demons, it can actually be a little simplistic. Myth number two that I want to expel is that demons can read minds. I think everyone's going to be really happy to hear that there is no scriptural evidence to support the notion that members of the heavenly host know a person's minds or thoughts other than God. Please breathe a sigh of relief. However, there are accounts within scripture of angels appearing to people in their dreams and in visions. Let me show you, we see it with Matthew, sorry, with, with uh, Joseph in Matthew chapter one, verse 20, where it says, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son and you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Likewise, we see it in Acts, in the account of Peter with Cornelius, where an angel speaks to Cornelius, it says, one afternoon about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. You see, even somebody who was not yet in the family of God was visited in a dream, in a vision by an angel. So while these occurrences certainly seem to suggest that supernatural beings can interact with us through dreams and visions, it doesn't produce any evidence of mind reading. The Apostle Paul does, however, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, instruct us to take captive every thought. To take captive every thought. That even though demons may not know your thoughts, you still have the responsibility to take captive every thought. Because your thoughts will lead you somewhere. Now thirdly, I might ask this one as a question. Can Christians be demon Possessed. Get your answer ready. How many people think Christians can be demon possessed? No, I'm just joking, don't need to answer. <laughs> can Christians be demon possessed? Well, what makes this question probably difficult to answer is the particular wording that is commonly used, the idea of the word possessed, because possessed denotes ownership. That if you possess something, I know this, uh, our campus pastor, Pastor Michelle, she's a previous lawyer, and possession is nine-tenths of the law. Okay, so possession is ownership. Okay, however, what we need to understand, and all spiritual believers are very clear on this, especially those who read the New Testament, is that, is that a member of the body of Christ cannot be owned by Satan or demons. Are you with me? This is because they have been purchased with the blood of Jesus 
and have the Spirit of God living and active in them. Romans 8 and 9 reveals this, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Verse 11, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. This is really good news for every Spirit-filled Christian in here. So maybe I could rephrase it just a little bit differently rather than asking, can a Christian be possessed by a demon uh, while a, a demon can't have a Christian, a Christian can't have a demon. That's what that means. You can't be owned by a demon, but Christians certainly can't have demons. Scripture shows us, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith and they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. So even Christians will be led by, by demons. That can't be owned necessarily by Satan. And I'm not gonna speak about Satan too much in this installment. I'm gonna focus on demons. We'll, we'll save that for another installment. But, but Christians can be demonized. And, and the way Christians are demonized is through varying forms, through persecution, through harassment, through, uh, by being captivated by false teaching, yes, yes. by being enslaved to sin and addiction. These are different ways in which demonization, I know we don't like to talk about that. We, we just like to talk about addictions as being treated by medication. But the truth of the reality is, Scripture reveals that even enslavement to sin or addictions are connected to demonic activity. I, I hope I'm not offending, but I do hope I'm poking at some demons today. I'm just hoping that you'll assess some errors in your life and go, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Is this okay? Are you with me? I'm not sure how to read some of your... Some of you are like freaked out right now. It's going to get way worse than this. We're just like at the surface myth level right now. You know what might be helpful? I doubt it, but it might be. Would be to understand that when it comes to the kingdom of darkness, that there is this sort of uh, hierarchy, so to speak, that exists. It's, it's not kind of the same as the heavenly hierarchy that we unpacked in week one. For example, in, in the heavenly hierarchy, in the kingdom of God, what we have is we have angels and we have spiritual beings. And that hierarchy is built on the attributes of, of order, of honor, of loyalty, of purpose and obedience. They're the elements that construct the hierarchy of heaven. That because God has a plan and because God created every being, they have a function within the order of Christ. God loves order. He is a God of order. This is why Paul preached so much to the new church, the early church, about having order in the services. Because order follows the structure of heaven and the purpose of God to be achieved requires order and obedience. Paul even says, we're gonna make you obedient. And when those who fail to be obedient, we're, we're gonna force them to. But this was Paul. Anyway, there is an order within the kingdom. In the kingdom of darkness, there is a, another hierarchy, but not built on the same hierarchy of heaven. The hierarchy within the kingdom of darkness is built on fear, control, coercion, and an aligned ambition of the evil spirits. In other words, as long as it gets me to where I wanna be, we'll, we'll partner. We'll order up. We'll, we'll, we'll come into agreement. Within the Scriptures, what you actually have is, you have mentioned evil spirits, unclean spirits, rulers, principalities, powers, and thrones. You've got different words that describe the, essentially what we call evil spirits. In other words, it's like a, a variety of spiritual entities that do the bidding of Satan, who we could quite accurately, to be honest with you, refer to as the head demon, as well as the enemy of Jesus. And as I said, I'm gonna reserve our conversation around Satan for another week. Because there's so many uh, I would say we could get real exhaustive on the subject and the ground that we could cover around the subject of demons. But for the sake of our time together today, I want us to focus our energy and, 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 and really our time around Scripture that reveals a useful backdrop to the unseen realm. I don't want us to just fill our head with unnecessary knowledge. I want us to use it as a backdrop so that we can know our purpose as the saints. And for starters... 
the origin of demons or evil spirits is actually certainly connected to the divine rebel, Satan, from the Garden of Eden, in the sense that he was the first of the Elohim or the divine counsel to rebel against God. All right, I'm going to try and pace myself. If you haven't come all each and every week of this series, I I can only support you so much. I can't cover past ground. You need to go back and get the podcast and and, and lesson up, okay? Because we already covered this ground. So I can only refer to it so that we can actually make some new ground today. And and what you have to understand is that as the first divine rebel within the divine council or what we call the Elohim of heaven, this in many ways led the way for spiritual beings, other spiritual beings to also rebel. That's what we found in Genesis chapter six from week one. Through choosing to leave their heavenly posts and their heavenly positions and instead taking up wives from the women of earth, they became what is referred to in Scripture as the Nephilim. The Nephilim. The the Nephilim whose offspring, they produced a race of giants referred to in Scripture as the Anakim. You feel free to write these things down. I ain't gonna repeat it all this time. You get the Nephilim, who the fallen angels produced a race of giants from their offspring called the Anakim, from which we get Goliath and many other giants that Joshua and Caleb and David and his mighty men killed. In fact, I love, I love this. As Joshua is allotting land by the direction of God to different tribes within Israel as they went to the promised land, he says to Caleb, he didn't tell Caleb what he gets. He asked Caleb, what do you want? And Caleb said, give me the hill country where the giants still are. <laughs> because you know, we learned from week one that God left some giants in the land to teach future generations warfare who never learned how to fight. So there were still some giants in the land and Caleb said, I'm still not done fighting. He was 87 years old, but he still wanted to go where the giants were because he had a mission and a mandate. He knew his power in Yahweh and he wanted to keep fighting. Love that about Caleb. And this is the line of Anakim, where the giants came from and the different nations. And since the Nephilim lost their immortality in the rebellion and their descent from heaven, from the heavenly position to earth, when they died, the Bible describes their disembodied spirits roamed the earth and the underworld and are referred to in Scripture as the Rephaim. That's the spirits which means shade, by the way. It's what Rephaim means. It means shade or shady, lurking in the shadows. What a description of the demonic, amen. And so the Rephaim is what the New Testament refers to as demons. I'm getting us there. Okay, I've got to cover a little bit of piece of this stuff together. So take notes and stay awake. This is what the New Testament referred to as demons and why they still aim to possess people today. In fact, let me put a pin in that and come back to it. Because within the realm of the Rephaim, what you have is Paul categorizes it as as principalities, which refers to territorial spirits, spirits over a territory, spirits that operate in policy and, and all those kinds of things. And then you've got powers, which refers to mediums, refers to fearful spirits. We're talking infirmities, unclean spirits are all in the category of powers. Now in the Old Testament, what we find through the introduction and worshipping of idols was one of the main tactics of the kingdom of darkness to deter the people of God from worshipping the one true God. So, So spirits manifest through idols. These idols weren't just wooden or bronze images useless, harmless idols. They were actually carved images or shaped images, built images that the Bible actually uh, refers to as represented specific demons, or evil spirits. And in some cases were actually possessed by these evil spirits. So for instance, you had Molech. I don't have time to go over all the, the idols and all the demonic spirits, but some in particular will illuminate some stuff. You had Molech. Molech was a pagan deity of the Canaanites that was depicted as a bull-headed anthropomorphic, if you want to get your head around that word, bronze idol that was actually heated so hot that it was glowing with flames. And it was actually worshipped through infanticide where they would put an infant within the hands of the flaming idol as a sacrifice. And many times God warned the people of Israel against this particular evil spirit. 
Leviticus 18, 21 says this, do not permit any of your children to be offered as a sacrifice to Molech, for you must not bring shame on the name of your God. I am the Lord. In addition to Molech, you had uh, Asherah. Asherah was a carved wooden pole that would be worshipped through temple prostitution. You had spirit of Baal and, uh, and Jezebel and different spirits that were worshipped, either made into carven images, wooden images, bronze Im- images, stone images that would be worshipped that ultimately were uh, representative of evil spirits. However, in the New Testament, we find the general term demon. Instead of getting specific, we call the term demon. Demon refers to every evil spirit and unclean spirit. Every unclean spirit that manifested in the presence of Jesus. Every unclean spirit that attempted to disrupt the ministry of the apostles by making noise and distracting people. Every spirit that, that uh, possesses people with the hope of producing fear and distracting believers from the purpose of God. These are the activities of demons in the New Testament. And a clear case of this is found in Luke chapter 8. I don't have time to really dig into it, but maybe you know the story in Luke chapter 8 where Jesus kind of confronted a demoniac in the region of the Gerasenes as he steps out of the boat and out of the cemetery where a demoniac just starts running and making noises and coming at Jesus, pleading with Jesus. Jesus, son of the most high God, recognizes Jesus and then requests, please do not send us into the abyss to wander the underworld. Please send us into the herd of pigs. You know the story. If you don't know the story, go to Luke chapter eight in your own time. A great read will freak you out. Uh, but, But nonetheless, a great story. And it's a confusing story because Jesus permits them to go into the herd of pigs. And what you need not be confused on is even though Jesus permits these demons to not go into the underworld, but to go into the herd of pigs who eventually run into the the, uh, sea and die anyway, uh, was not an act of mercy toward demons, but a display of His authority in both the seen and the unseen realm. Are you with me? This is important to know. Jesus was revealing that His authority extends beyond the seen realm into the unseen realm, that even demons obey, that He holds the keys in their, uh, in their world as, as well. So, so what I want to show you, in fact, is that keep this in mind as we progress a little bit further, because I want to come back to that again in a moment. I'm kind of going to weave a few things together this morning. This is like a seminar. So Amen Conference won't be like a seminar, but this moment is like a seminar. Okay, we're just doing some teaching. I'll get preaching in a second. Because earlier, one of the things I mentioned is that the main agenda of the demonic is actually to confuse Christians, confuse, create confusion within the body of Christ in the hopes of disrupting the plans and the purpose of God. Uh, let Let me help you understand. Demons are not trying to recruit or convert people into Satan worshippers. That's not what they're trying to do. If you think, oh, well, at least I'm not worshiping Satan, I'm good. That's not what they're trying to do. They ain't trying to get you to, you know, put 666 on everything and wear a mark of a beast or something like that. They're not, they're not that's not their goal. They're simply focused on, on holding on to territory that they currently possess and disorienting believers and the church in the hopes of rendering us ineffective in our mission of reclaiming humanity for God. To nullify believers. In fact, most of the time we picture demonic activity like thrashing around, levitating like stranger things and bones breaking, right? Like pretty vile activity. That's how we often view demonic activity. Let me tell you, it's way worse. It's way worse. The reason it's worse is because it's way more subtle than that. Like that would be obvious. If it happened like that, that would be very clear. Demon. But it ain't that obvious. In fact, in reality, demonic activity is way more subtle in the hopes that it will lead you willingly into captivity. That you will go without a fight. That you will walk yourself into bondage. That you will walk yourself into a 
prison and captivity of sorts. This is because the power of darkness actually has a limited effect in the life of the believer when the believer is resistance. In fact, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. All you have to do is resist. But if you can go willingly and subtly, that's how the demonic works in the life of believers. And through tools such as, let me expose them, lust, pornography, even alcoholism, and, and, and even, dare I say, the facade of freedom through things like liberalism, the demonic can, can lure Christians really into an unwilling or a willing submission. Even through, like, I, wanna, I, I really want to maybe poke at some demons and provoke some demonic activity. That's kind of, because you, unless you, unless you define it, it's hard to defeat it. The purpose of this sermon is not to elevate demons or demonic activity, but to help identify it so we can defeat it. Yeah. And one of the more subtle ways that we even see uh, demonic activity on earth today is, is it happens in the arena of abortion. Like the spirit of Molech that was present with Pharaoh when Pharaoh told the midwives to kill every Hebrew boy in the hope to prevent Moses from being born and, and the purposes of God being achieved is the same spirit of Molech that was active in Herod when Herod tried to kill every child under two to subvert the plan of Jesus, the Messiah being born, is the same spirit that is active in the womb today and in the eradication of, of infants today. I'm not trying to be political. This ain't a political thing. Trust me, we keep politics out of the pulpit. I ain't trying to do that. I'm just trying to reveal the way that the enemy still works and you got a lot of believers who advocate and playing into the subtle plan, willingly the subtle plan of a spirit of Molech and demonic spiritual forces in, 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 because, because believers are subtly playing into the, the, the position of rights with the agenda of freedom. Now, I'm all for freedom, but freedom doesn't come at the expense of somebody else's captivity or death. That's not how freedom works. So it's subtle because it seems like freedom of choice the freedoms, if it puts someone else in bondage, is not true freedom. The Bible says, whomever the Son sets free is free indeed. And freedom comes to all those as a result. So freedom, and so, and so we see this subtle tactics where, where even spiritual believers get pulled and led astray by subtle demonic stuff. It'd be so much easier if it was just blatantly, you know, cracks and, you know, blah, you know vomit and heads spinning around. That would be... Easy, see it. But that's why you're gonna be on your guard. That's why the Bible says be on your guard. Slinking around in the refe in the shadow, in the shade, tricking, tricking people. Now, what we also cannot afford to do is confuse subtle tactics as a substitute for power. Because demons certainly possess power. This is why Ephesians 6 says, put on the full armor of God. Because if the fiery arrows of the evil one didn't have the potential to pierce your mind and your soul, then you would not need to armor up. I mean, I'm just preaching simple stuff here. This is like, this is like Sunday school stuff, but I feel like sometimes we need to revisit this stuff because it's revelational for some people. Go, oh, the whole time. That's right. So you get an armor of God because there is an enemy, even though he works subtly, is not a substitute or, or a reduction of power. However, any power of the kingdom of darkness is far less than the power of the kingdom of God. I need to put it in perspective. Just because God's kingdom is powerful doesn't mean that the kingdom of darkness is not powerful, but the kingdom of light is more powerful. Are you with me? All right. I'm just trying to make sure I'm covering the right ground, making sure I'm getting collective, mm -hmm, amen, at least a little nod that will help me. This is evident in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, we've got what uh, we could describe as a group of itinerant exorcists. Can you imagine that as, a, as, a, as a, a title? Like I'm an itinerant exorcist. I'm here to get rid of your demons. That's what I'm here calling the, the exorcist. This is what they did. You've got, you've got these group of itinerant exorcists in Acts chapter 19 who were the sons of Sceva. Sceva was a leading priest in the synagogue at that time. The synagogue that kicked out Paul, by the way. And... Uh, and we've got them and they decide that generally, if, if your dad was a leading priest, you would go into priesthood as well. Yeah. 
But there wasn't apparently that much appealing to them about, you know, the yes, like the smoke and the chanting and all the things that they would do. And, you know, they like, mm, I don't know about that. But the demon expulsion stuff, that looks exciting. So they decided collectively as brothers, let's go into the business of casting out demons. We think it's more profitable and uh, way more thrilling. And, and so Acts chapter 19 is the account of them who apparently... But by scriptural evidence had some form of effect because they were still in business after going from town to town. Either that or they had no success and they're gonna still try it in this town. Scripture's not that clear, but it says they traveled from town to town casting out demons. And they had witnessed in, in one of their experiences in Ephesus, Paul casting out demons in the name of Jesus and they too attempted to use this authority to which we find them literally overcome by the man with the demon, uh, with the evil spirit, that it's, it severely beat them and left them naked. Now, as you would expect, this not only put a reverence and a fear across the entire city, but has been cause for fear and reverence even in Christians today when it comes to uh, demonic activity. However, there's something very important that I need you to know. I'm getting really excited here because I know where we're going in this sermon. What you need to know is that what we can't afford to miss in this dramatic display of the demonic in Scripture is actually a pattern that has been emerging throughout this whole series, in fact, and shown evidently here in this story around supernatural activity. And it has to do with the local lecture hall. Check it out. Acts 19, let me remind you. Verse eight, you probably missed it. It says, then Paul went to the synagogue and he preached only for three months. But after three months of arguing persuasively, mind you, about the kingdom of God, people became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking his way. So Paul, he left the synagogue, he took the believers with him and they held their daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So, so here we've got Paul who does the normal thing, the pattern of the apostles going into a new city, sets up shop at the synagogue where you did spiritual discussion. But because they were rejecting his message about Jesus, Christ crucified, what they did is they kicked him out and Paul had no other option but to set up shop in a rented hall, a public facility. Now what you cannot afford to miss because the Bible illuminates it, that from that moment, both Jews and Greeks or Jews and Gentiles began to hear the Word of God. In the synagogue, only Jews were permitted. Now this is important to note and understand because what we know throughout this series and the pattern is that when when Peter, the opposition that sprung up against Peter that forced him to be arrested, put in prison and James killed was after, he took the gospel to the Gentiles. We saw he just previously preached to Cornelius and his whole entire household got saved. That activated a move of God amongst the Gentiles. All of a sudden, a resistance and an opposition came up. We saw it just with Jesus in the region of the Gerasenes, that the moment he stepped out of Jewish territory into Gentile territory, he was instantly met with demonic opposition and resistance. Here we've got Paul going out of the synagogue into a lecture hall, into Gentile, ter- they were taking territory off the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. These weren't the people of God. And so you will always get resistance when the kingdom advances beyond territory that is already kingdom owned into territory that is occupied by the kingdom of darkness. Be warned that that's where demonic activity begins. If you ain't doing any of that, don't worry about demonic activity. A side note, but if you're fulfilling the kingdom of God, do not be surprised by resistance, do not be surprised by opposition. There is resistance and opposition to the advancement of the kingdom because the advancement of the kingdom is done violently, and the violent take it by force. You are the aggressor on the earth. Oh, I cannot stress this point enough. Too many believers think they're the passive ones. Like, let's just get a, you know, a, a container, shipping container. We'll move out into the wilderness. We'll stock up on, you know, several years of canned goods and we'll put like grass on top and satellites won't be able to see us and we'll hide out. And then when Jesus comes back, we'll say, we made it. That's not the goal of Christian activity. 
Why would you as the aggressor be hiding out? Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Remember, gates are not an offensive weapon. They're a defensive weapon. The gates are holding you back from getting the territory that God has called you to claim back off the enemy. That's what the kingdom of God is doing. We're advancing, we're advancing, we're taking ground, we're taking captives back, setting them free. They're prisoners, prisoners of war. Everybody doesn't belong to the kingdom of God or literally bound up. We're gonna talk about spiritual warfare next week. We're gonna go deeper into that. But we're setting people free. This is what deliverance is, by the way. We don't use the word deliverance in this Western culture because people are freaked out by the word. We use freedom. Now we've revealed all our cards. <laughs> Haven't done a deliverance altar call in a while. But you may reflect on the fact that we said, hey, if anyone wants to get free, come to the altar. Same idea, just different words. But God wants you to be free, set free, free indeed. That's how we take ground. Let me get back to my notes here. I've got to make sure we get along here. So what we've got is we've got this demoniac manifested. We've got this, this, it says here, it says there's a pattern, there's a pattern, there's a pattern, there's a pattern of power. Paul was given unusual power, unusual power, so potent that when even handkerchiefs or aprons, it says, that had merely touched his skin, were placed on sick people, they weren't just healed of their diseases, evil spirits came out. That's... That's potent right there. This is actually reminiscent of the power that Jesus uh, gave to the disciples when, when recruiting them in Matthew chapter 10. Man, I've got to get up. I've got to get up. Can I move this? I'm getting excited. Because you, you think, sometimes we think that we're called by God to just live a, a neat, cute Christian life. That was not present at the recruiting of the disciples. What was present at the recruiting of the disciples was very clear, and we often miss it as modern disciples of Jesus Christ, but it's revealed in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Jesus called His 12 disciples and gave them authority. Remember that word? You might want to write that down. Gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. This is, a, this is exciting stuff. That the moment the disciples came, of course He said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Okay, you ain't fishing for fish anymore. I'm gonna make you fishers of men. But guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna give you power. I'm gonna give you authority to cast out demons and heal people of their diseases. The disciples knew this. That word power is actually exousia power. It translates in English as authority. But God gave them authority. It's the word the pilot uses when when he was at the trial of Jesus. And Pilate literally looked at Jesus and said, don't you know I have the power to condemn you or to crucify you? I love what Jesus responds with. He says, you have no power, exousia, authority over me if it were not given to you from above. So he puts in perspective, Pilate, you think you have authority. But any authority you think you have only comes from God because even what you're doing in crucifying me is playing into the purpose of heaven. He used the word power. Jesus used the word authority. Authority. Later we see in Luke where Jesus sends out the 72 disciples. I love this. I love their response. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, it says, When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to Him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. So the authority, the exousia that the, He sent them out with, they got a firsthand experience and their report was, even the demons obey us. That's where the accent is in the Scripture. Even the demons obey us. You gotta do a high voice. It's like shock. Us, fishermen, untrained. In fact, that was the description of the disciples when they stood before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were confused because these weren't like liturgical trained, uh, educated in Scripture men. They were mere fishermen and zealots that had obviously been with Jesus. So even the disciples are like, ha, us, it ain't us. Even demons obey us when we use Your Name. So they attribute the power coming from the authority that comes when you're in alignment with the name of Jesus. 
Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. So what we've got here, check this out, check this out. We've got this idea of exousia, this authority that, that when mere cloth touched Him, so potent was the, the authority of God that it didn't even need a pattern. This Scripture is not about a pattern, by the way, of, okay, let's get all the cloths out here and let's start laying hands on them and let's take them and start flinging them out on everybody. It's, that's not the, the purpose of this. Maybe that works, I don't know, but it's not the purpose of that story. The purpose of that story is to say the power of God is so potent that it's not limited to you actually touching somebody, that it can work in any way that God needs it to work. It's, a, it's just in a presence. Another passage shows that even the shadows, as they went over people, they got healed. Proximity. Potent stuff, the power of God. You need to know that. It says in the, and then we see, we see, see, it was obviously so impressive that the leading priests, as soon as, 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 son, as, as soon as his sons heard about it, they wanted to do it and they attempted it. They attempted to rebuke the evil spirit and they said it this way in their incantation they said, In the name of Jesus, that Paul preaches. Now, not only did this not work, it had the opposite effect. However, the key to authority and power over the demonic is actually revealed in the response from the demon. Did you know that? The demon gives it away. Literally, not super smart, just gives it all away. But if you're not smart, you'll miss it. So pay attention. That's what the demon says. The demon says, but, when, but one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul but who the hell are you? I added hell because of the series title. I know Paul. Very familiar with Paul. Paul's casting out our hordes everywhere. Trust me, I know Jesus that you use the word Jesus. We know Jesus. But who the hell are you? You know, when it comes to demonic activity, there are far too many believers trying to hide away, trying to be invisible, trying to be ignorant, as if your invisibility makes you fly under the radar and removes you from demonic activity. I've got to tell you that when you're facing off in this life with demonic activity, the demon reveals it's better to be known than unknown. <laughs> it's way better to be known than to be unknown. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Kira, I know. Michelle, I know. Luke, I know. I don't wanna be unknown, I don't wanna be ignorant. I don't wanna be mysterious in the kingdom of darkness. I don't wanna be unknown, hidden out, non effective. I don't wanna be out of my alignment with God. I wanna be known. I wanna be known one with authority. I wanna be one. Uh, every time I walk, demons begin to quake. Leave it here for a second. I need, I got some key on there that I wanna read. Take that. I wanna read this one that I wrote down. The idea is to be known. I wanna take it a step further because what we have in Scripture is this idea of authority. And as I said at the beginning, ignorance makes you more susceptible to demonic influence. So, so while we know the reality of demons, what we're better to know is the reality of our authority. I know we preached on demons. You don't need to get caught up with demons. What you've just heard is really all you need to know. Knowing more just makes you knowledgeable, I guess, and flex on people. But better than knowing more about demons is knowing more about your authority. Knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> See, within Jesus' hierarchy in the unseen realm, there is, a, there is a hierarchy within the seen realm. And just like every spiritual being that is created has free will, you also have free will. But when you use your free will to ultimately bring yourself under God's will, that's where you find authority. Are you with me? In fact, could you stand to your feet? Because I'm, I'm missing some folk. I need, to, I need to eyeball every single person. Stand with me, stand with me, stand with me, stand with me, stand with me. I need to make sure you get this. I'm trying to find every single eyeball in this place. I'm trying to find every person. I'm, just so you know, I'm preaching right at you right now. 
that when you bring your free will and you bring it under God's will, you are now in alignment with God. Alignment releases authority. If I give one of my staff members a signing, signing authority, they sign in alignment with me. That's how they have authority. In the Kingdom of God, you use your free will to come into the will of God. The will of God is to fulfill His purpose, to extend heaven, to reclaim earth, to, to fulfill the Great Commission, go into all the world. When you bring your free will into alignment with God's will, you see a release of authority. Every demon has to shake and quake every time you enter the room. Every darkness must flee under the Name of Jesus. When you begin to preach in the Name of Jesus, not only do they know the Name of Jesus, but they know you because you are covered with the blood of Jesus. Just the way, the same way that God sees Jesus when He looks at you, a devil and a demon will see Jesus when they look at you because I am an ambassador for Christ Jesus. I come with a certified seal of authority. Church, I'm trying to get you activated in your understanding that you walk with a power, that you do not need to fear any demon or demonic force. You have the very power of heaven at your disposal. So potent, so powerful that you begin to expel demons. Darkness has to flee. However, before you start exercising this on others, would you set yourself free? Oh, you didn't think we we're gonna go there. Oh, you want me to commission you to go out into your workplace and set your employer free? <laughs> Before you set others free, set yourself free. This is the pur purpose of repentance, by the way. Repentance is realignment. It's repentance. How is going this way? I'm turning, I'm going back to you, God. I'm realigning to your way. I've let sin enter into my life. I've let thoughts come in and captivate my mind. I'm taking those thoughts captive. I'm surrendering to you and God, I'm repenting. This is why the Bible says, repent daily, therefore. Repent daily, therefore. Repentance is not a penance. It's not a whipping. It's not a beating. It's not a woe am I. No, it's saying, God, I've recognised I have sin in my life. So God, I surface that sin to You. I repent of that. God, I'm coming back into alignment with You. Release Your authority again so I can walk in power. I put on the full armour of God. I put on salvation as a helmet. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I lift up the shield of truth. I lift the shield of faith. I am walking in the full armour as a, as a soldier of Christ Jesus. Not ignorant. Not ignorant, fully aware, fully aware. So we're gonna set ourselves free right now. You ready? It's called repenting. And we have a moment. So when you do this, if you're willing to participate in a moment of repentance before God, because you want the authority of God to come back into your world. Some of you have recognised I've been walking out of authority. I've been out of alignment with God. Maybe you're a Christian, maybe you're a believer, maybe you've confessed Jesus as Lord some point in your life, but you know you've let sin reign in your life. You know there's been addictions that you've held on to. You know that there has been a participation in things that you know is not of God. Well, here's the good news. I don't need to come lay hands on you or get an anointed cloth. You can come to God for yourself and say, God, I repent of my wicked ways. David said, search my heart. Find any wicked way within me. Redeem me, Lord. So let me lead us in repentance for a moment. Why don't we close our eyes? Why don't we open our hands before the living God? And God, right now in this moment of repentance, we acknowledge Your power. We acknowledge Your purpose. God, we also acknowledge that there are things in our life that are not of You. Things that we've lingered on, pondered on, let reign in our life. And God, we're realigning right now. We rebuke those things out of our life. We remove, remove them. God, we pray that You would take them. And God, in our free will, we choose to come into Your will. Let Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let Your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. God, I wanna walk in Your power. I wanna walk in Your authority. I wanna be aligned with Your purpose. God, I wanna serve You on this earth. God, I wanna lift Your Name. Come on, anybody who's feeling free right now, I need you to lift your praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on.